Okay, the purpose of this video is for you to check your plate tectonics review. And we're in preparation for our big unit test on plate tectonics. And this test is not eligible for a retake because we've already had a quiz that was eligible for a retake before it. We're going to have a, a free choice project after and those uh, but over the same standards, that's eligible for revision. But this is a one time only. So you want to really be working to master this content. So the first question was asking us, about the differences between um, continental and oceanic crust, and there are some major differences. Continental crust is thicker. That's why it actually is out of the ocean. Oceanic crust is thinner, and that's why it's underwater, because think about it, the crust all starts where the mantle stops. So the deepest part of the ocean is the thinnest crust, and Mount Everest in Nepal is the thickest. Now, even though continental crust is thicker, think of it this way, the mass is more spread apart oceanic crust is thinner and more densely packed. So there's definitely a density difference there. Less dense continental, more dense oceanic. And the reason for the density difference is the composition. So composition means what it's made of. And the composition of continental crust is silicate minerals, basically quartz, feldspars. Native elements are in oceanic crust. Those are things like copper and lead, and those are more tightly packed atoms. So um, native elements, or and I just put in parentheses, you don't have to have this part. Those are non-silicate minerals. So now the next set of questions ask us more about Earth's layers. So question number two, how do we know anything about what the mantle's made of? Um, the underlined words there, it's volcanic eruption. Scientists cannot drill down into the mantle, but the mantle comes to us during volcanoes. Um, so question number three, as you get closer to the inner core, you get the layers to be both hotter and under more pressure. So what would... Um, the increase in temperature do. Remember this concept, higher temperatures move molecules apart. So the answer to number three is it would make them turn liquid. But then an increase in pressure does the opposite. That increase in pressure makes the rock want to stay a solid. So it's this battle between temperature and pressure. Now question number five, what layer of the earth is the same as saying a tectonic plate? That is the lithosphere, and the upper part of the lithosphere is of the crust. So they're similar terms, but technically a tectonic plates are lithosphere, and they are floating on the astenosphere. Now the plates, number seven, are solid, but the jelly-like astenosphere, that's where the convection, the rising and sinking like a lava lamp is happening to help keep the plates moving. So the only right answer to number eight is jelly. Okay, and now check this out. I've embedded a lot of really good uh, diagrams and pictures into this presentation to help you review. So here we see our three layer system, crust, mantle, core. I like this because here we see the continental crust, thicker but less dense, the oceanic crust, thinner but more dense. And then over here we see lithosphere and astenosphere. The sections of lithosphere are our plates, the jelly-like astenosphere underneath it, that's what the plates float on. Now apparently I did not like question nine, who knows what I was thinking. So number 10, describe Alfred Wegener's theory of continental drift. I expect that to be in just in these two words, that Pangea split, that there was this supercontinent that um, disconnected. Now question number 11 there, um, three pieces of evidence. I put three, but there's actually more than three. I'll talk through some. Same fossils on different continents. Hey, that's weird. Unless the continents were together when those creatures died and then they got separated. How else would those plants and animals get across the ocean? Glacial grooves. You can't just say glacial grooves on your test or fossils on your test. You have to be clear. Here's what's weird about the glacial grooves. These erosion marks from glaciers, they match on different continents. That's odd unless the continents were together and then split after the um, glacial grooves had been eroded there. And this is my personal favorite. Wegener said, it's a perfect fit. The continents must have once had a grip. You can really know Notice that with coastlines. Other right answers here that I would accept on your test, that rock types match across continents. That's something that came up. And another thing with the fossil record, remember us singing tropical fossils sitting in Greenland. So having fossils in the wrong climate shows that Greenland, for example, wasn't always where it currently is. It's also true for Ohio. When our um, fossils from an old ocean were laid down, we are actually south of the equator here. So that's evidence that the continents have moved. Now, Alfred Wegener, as we know, had a problem. He had really good evidence to support his idea of Pangea, 
but he did not have an answer to the question how they split and he really did make something up. So here's number 12. What happens during seafloor spreading? You must have the word magma. You must have the place, the mid-ocean ridge. So magma comes out at the mid-ocean ridge and then you can't stop there. So what actually happens to push Pangea apart? So the magma cools into new ocean floor that pushes, or you could say chisels the old crust away, and that's what's moved the continents. Now this whole process is known as seafloor spreading, and since Iceland is on that very northern portion of the mid-ocean ridge, this is the plate tectonic story there in Iceland. Okay, so a couple of, um, or an image actually to show you. So when you check this out with me, here is seafloor spreading. Now we'll get into this a little more, but if we were gonna put arrows, remember this is a divergent pull away boundary. That's why the magma comes out. And then do you see this little cartoon character? Seafloor spreading, it's tearing me apart, help. And that's literally what's happening on the mid-ocean ridge is that the plates are moving away, leaving that spot for magma to get out. Now, I didn't say this earlier, but of course, when you're studying, you could pause me, I'll go back into different parts of the presentation. If I ever go too fast, just listen again. Okay, so now, number 13 there, Alfred Wegener never ever used the term seafloor spreading, and he never ever used the term plate tectonics. So what do we mean by plate tectonics? It's actually the combination of Alfred's idea of continental drift plus the how, plus seafloor spreading. So that's a more modern term that we call plate tectonics. Now, what about number 14? What is convection? Convection is rising and sinking of mantle material. It would also be okay if you said rising and sinking of the asthenosphere. They're almost synonyms. And then notice that that's actually a two-part question. How does um, convection assist in the movement of tectonic plates? Remember, like a lava lamp, convection in the jelly-like asthenosphere under the uh, tectonic plates, it's kind of like wheels to keep them moving. And then number 15, scientists said there are three boundaries, right? And so this time, I want you not just to say push, pull, slide. I want you to use fancy words. So transform means slide or slide by. Divergent means pull away. And convergent means collide. Or you could just say push. Okay, so now here are some diagrams and pictures to help you. This uh, relates to question 14. Okay, so do you notice here's the mid-ocean ridge. Here's where the plates pull away and the magma comes out to cool into new crust. So the dark brown is the lithosphere, the tectonic plates. But look underneath, the jelly-like asthenosphere, we have this rising and sinking of mantle material. That's called convection. And it's happening everywhere, all the time under plates to help them keep moving. Remember this part? It's hotter down here. So you get less dense um, material that rises, rises, rises. Up here, it's a little cooler. So the um, mantle material, the jelly, like a stenosphere material, is smushed together and sink. So that's constant. And then this is just a diagram of the three plate boundaries up here. So notice the slide by, which is transform, the pull away, which is divergent. And here's one example of a push boundary or a collide boundary, which is called convergent. So that's how like a quick diagram would look of those. Okay, so once we had those basics down, we went to California and studied earthquake work. So you should have the only right answer for 16 is seismic waves. Um, that's how the energy from earthquakes travel. Number 17, what's the difference in body and surface? Body waves stay inside the earth. Surface waves do what they sound like. They go to the surface and do damage. Number 18, which type of waves are primary and secondary or PNS waves? They're definitely body waves. They're not the scary kind. They're actually the helpful kind in locating the epicenter. Um, number 19, differences between PNS waves. I remember it by SSS. Um, secondary waves are slower and they only go through solids. The way I typed it here is that P waves are faster and S waves can only go through solids. Hey, historically, question 20 is the toughest. Oh, I just scratched my head and my hair got crazy there. Um, sorry about that. So before we get to question 20, though, I really like seeing it this way, the um, different types of seismic waves. So we have body and surface. Surface do damage. Body stay in the earth. Then we have primary and secondary, and here's what I meant by SSS, secondary or slower, only through solids. So you notice the primary and secondary waves aren't even the right type of seismic wave to do the damage. Okay, number 20, 
is tough. <laughs> I agree. I left you lots of space to write about it or type about it. Um, and so here's the deal. How do scientists find the epicenter of the quake? And we had to use lag time, P waves, S waves, distance, and the number three. Woo. Okay, so here's my first sentence. Seismologists use the lag time between the P and S waves at three locations to calculate the distance each city is from the epicenter. So we have lag time to distance. And then through the three, right, we call it triangulation. They draw three circles on a map to represent that distance where they all three overlap. That's the epicenter. So, of course, pause me if you need to get that down. Now, check this out. Here's an example um, I used for you guys already. I think, yes, but I used a couple different ones, too. But this is showing that process of triangulation. So Charleston, South Carolina, Detroit, Michigan, and Minneapolis, none of those were the epicenter. There was a lag time between the PNS waves. We can tell Detroit had the smallest lag time because it has the smallest circle. It's closest to the quake. But then do you notice that all three circles only meet right here? Now, you might be thinking, could we ever have an epicenter here in the middle of a tectonic plate? And the answer is, yeah, there are still fault lines. Um, from stress on the crust, but not as well developed as over here at the plate boundary in California. So now question number 21 has to do with our studies in Iceland. Where are the youngest rocks on the ocean floor and how do we know? They would be near the mid-ocean ridge. So Iceland is actually very new crust um, and that's because the magma comes out there to make new crust. Now in our study of Nepal, Mount Everest, we found a crazy discovery. We found in our rock type analysis that limestone is on the top of Mount Everest. And we know that limestone is sedimentary and is generally chocked full of ocean fossils. That is also true at the top of Mount Everest. So what that tells us is that that limestone was laid down under an ocean and the push boundary like a conveyor belt thrust those ocean fossils way up over five miles high at the top of Mount Everest. The ocean was never up there. That limestone was down under sea level once upon a time and the plate motion has made it go up, up, up at the tip top of that mountain. Okay, now we get to our work of um, volcanic eruptions. So when you look at this, these two pictures, a here is Mauna Loa, which is in on the big island of Hawaii, the one that's right under the hot spot. And we can see lava flows here, but we also see something else. And then this is actually Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines, but it behaves just like Mount Fuji would have when Mount Fuji last erupted in the 1700s. So which one is non-explosive? Well, it's definitely A. But don't be fooled here. This is not volcanic ash and it is not smoke. That is steam. That's just water vapor. Over here, that's volcanic ash. Those are pulverized little bits of rock that are coming up into the air. It feels like a lot like clay sediment, if you remember that, um, but it's definitely rock. Okay, so now let's get to our questions. So 23, we would see lava at non-explosive. We would see pyroclastic materials, rock chunks is what that means, of course, um, like ash, lapilli, and volcanic bombs would all be good answers at explosive. Now, what's the science behind this? If you have an explosive eruption, you have high amounts of silica, that's number 25. Oh, no, I'm sorry, I misspoke there. You would have high viscosity or resistant magma. The reason for that is the silica inside it fits tightly. So when you have, um, when you have for number 27 there, magma with lots of silica, you get this high viscosity um, magma that resists flow and clogs up the vent. Now, which type of crust is high in silicate minerals? Number 28, it's actually continental crust. So that's why we don't see this explosive activity in Hawaii. Hawaii's magma source is all melted oceanic crust, and that's low in silica, not much tight-fitting silica, runny, runny lava flows. Okay, so now I am going with you now to what I would consider to be the toughest part of the test. So what you're going to be doing for a major part of your test is sketching and explaining the plate tectonic story and our five places that we travel. So the first thing that you needed to do was just the matching of the correct boundaries. So California is a transform boundary, which is B. 
Iceland is a divergent boundary, D. Nepal is C, continental, continental convergent. Hawaii is the crazy one, not at a plate boundary, in the middle of a plate. And then Mount Fuji in Japan is E, continental oceanic convergent. Now, the next part is to match the explanation. So, um, the matching here goes like this, C, E, A, B, D. And so you can use those explanations um, in, you, in your studies to help you know what you're going to say when you describe each place. But what I want to do now is show you some potential um, inspiration for your sketches, okay? So when you, I ask you to sketch California, notice this. Those are the fence lines. What do you notice about the arrows, right? They're sliding by. So it's a transform boundary where the plates slide. So we have the San Andreas Fault, and it makes it earthquake prone. Okay, so you can pause and study that and check your sketch and make sure it has those elements in it. I'm really scoring to see that your arrows are right for the fence line. Now, this is somebody's a 3D model from the past, and you notice that under here they've got slide-by arrows and an offset fence, um, so that's kind of a, a similar. So what about Iceland? Iceland is the site of seafloor spreading. So I absolutely need to see your arrows going in the opposite way, labeling the mid-ocean ridge. Now, do you understand this part? Right, the magma comes out and it cools into new crust. Now, what's it doing to the old crust? Chiseling or pushing it away, right? So now, how might that actually look? Um, if we were making a model of it, something like this, mid-ocean ridge, plates moving away, a, a volcanic eruption, right? So you can pattern your diagram after that. Now our um, next spot, oh, whoops, I also had this one, kind of another idea of what you could draw for Iceland. Our next one was Nepal. So you notice Nepal is different. So the plates are pushing together, are colliding, and you have to label this. You can't just put arrows together because it matters what type of crust is hitting. So we have continental crust hitting continental crust, and this has to be in your explanation. Same density, nothing sinks, right? This continental, continental convergent boundary, and you might even label ocean fossils at the top. Um, and here was a diagram of that. Now Hawaii, something like this needs drawn. How many plates? Not two one, right? It's in the middle of a plate. So you have the Pacific plate moving in kind of a northwest direction, which I won't score you off of that. But, um, you know, your arrow, just one, really, or you could have multiple all in the same direction like this. And then I need a hot spot labeled and the magma rising up to make this island chain. Here was an example of a 3D model from the past. And you can see one arrow, one plate. This would be the plate moving over the hot spot. Now, Mount Fuji, Japan, is different. Notice this. Two arrows pushing, but wait. Here's the continental crust. Here's the oceanic. You must label the crust. And as the oceanic crust sinks, in my mind it sings a song. It's getting hot in here. I'm turning into magma. And you must label subduction zone or talk about it in your explanation. That sinking place, the subduction zone, is where you get the melting of the oceanic crust. And then as the oceanic crust comes up, it dissolves some of that continental crust high in silica. Just like the black stopper, pressure builds, pressure builds, boom, you get an explosive eruption like Mount Fuji in Japan. Notice the difference here, right? With oceanic crust, I need a sinker. When you do Nepal, continental, continental crust, no sinker. Same density, nothing sinks. And so here was an example of a, a continental oceanic convergent plate boundary or Mount Fuji, right? You can see the sinking oceanic crust, the continental crust not sinking, the plates coming together, and magma forming. Okay, so I would honestly practice your sketches without looking. See if you can sketch the plate tectonic story well and label it at every place. You have to convince me that you really understand the plate tectonic story at all of our locations.